And now that recording is in progress, once again, I want to thank you for joining us tonight or in the future if you're on recording to the Los Angeles Birders webinar for tonight. Uh, Los Angeles Birders is an all volunteer organization. What that means is besides, all, besides the fact that we're not paid, it also means that all of your donation and all of your membership dues goes into our programs and goes into the actual um, organization. So if you haven't yet uh, made a donation to Los Angeles Birders, please consider doing so. You can go to our website at labirders.org, click on donation, and we thank you in advance for helping us out. Thank you very much. Uh, those donations and uh, web, uh, membership dues help support things like this live and recorded webinars. All our webinars are open access, meaning open to everyone, to the entire Bergen community, because that is what we do. We want to improve the Bergen community in our area and our, our, all around. Uh, we have lots of community science projects ongoing. And we have a thriving student section, as Henry just told us. So please, please help us out. And with that, I would love to introduce Henry Chu, who will be introducing our speaker for tonight. Henry. Thank you, Ron. So Los Angeles Birders is very pleased to have Ted Kyle with us tonight. Ted is an avian ecologist and GIS analyst. Ted grew up birding along the Racine Lakeshore in Wisconsin. He loves watching large flocks of birds and often can be found at migration sites. Ted says that he has always loved raptors and bird migration, and especially large numbers of birds in migration. This works out well for raptors, since there are so many great places for viewing huge numbers of raptors in flight. Ted has been fortunate enough to keep, to be able to keep count at many of these locations, most notably the Florida Keys, hawkwads for thousands of peregrine falcons. Ted has just returned from his second fall season, counting raptors in Veracruz, Mexico. Veracruz hosts the largest migration of birds in the world, with millions of raptors counted each season. His biggest days have exceeded 200,000 birds of prey, not to mention all of the other migrants, such as white-winged doves, dick thistles, and scissor-tailed flycatchers. Yeah. During spring migration, Ted has helped count around 500,000 Old World Raptors in Eilat, Israel, and migration site that held the record for the largest spring migration. Ted also really enjoys photographing birds, especially birds in flight. So participating in raptor watches along with birds in flight photography provides Ted with a great and challenging opportunity to combine those two passions. It is our pleasure to welcome Ted to talk for LA Birders. So please welcome Ted. Thank you very much. I really appreciate being invited back and I hope that you all enjoy the show and the presentation. If you can yeah, that looks verify good. that that looks good. That does. Okay. So like last time, I'm going to be talking about raptor identification. Unlike last time, though, this time I'm going to assume at least some familiarity with birds and prey, such as different groups, species, some terminology. Uh, if you're completely new to identifying birds of prey, uh, please see my earlier talk or Desi's earlier talk on Los Angeles birders um, that's on the YouTube channel. Both of those talks are, are freely available. Uh, just as a, another note about this presentation, all uncredited photos are mine, and if you want the, the too long didn't read version, it ultimately boils to a similar thing as my last talk of it's probably easier to just identify them in flight by shape and structure and, and not worry too much about the, the plumage details. So what is a dark raptor? Here we have a single image with four Swainson's hawks with the darkest one in the middle, a very light white adult on the left, and then two younger birds as well. 
Uh, I'm mostly going to be covering species that have plumages that are entirely to mostly dark brown to blackish. And while I realize this is a little vague and it's, it's going to be a little more inclusive than what's typically covered is a lot of the main focus on dark raptors tend to be on, on buteos, which have a majority of color variation within raptors in the U.S., uh, it's it's not really an easy thing, and there are a lot more dark raptors than, than solely buteos. And usually what's referred to is, is polymorphism, so multiple different colors, which extends, the terminology extends to, to more than just dark light, especially light forms can, can also be covered. Um, why is polymorphism is a really good question. We don't really have a great answer. There's a couple ideas. Maybe maybe the prey doesn't recognize the dark birds as something to be feared. Maybe there's some sort of, of advantage, of, of niche advantage to dark birds preying. Maybe it's not directly prey related. It could be something for survival. Darker birds absorb more sunlight in the winter or something along those lines. It's... Uh, it's it's still pretty up in the air as to why polymorphism exists to the extent that it does. Um, and the variation is, is really fun because as you can see in this, this photo, these are all Swainson's hawks. Red tails also have a very wide range, but only in certain subspecies. And then you have some birds like zone-tailed hawk and common black hawk, which aren't polymorphic, they're only dark. And so there's an array of possibilities that are across and even within species. In general, the dark color variant is less common than the, the light color, color variant, like broadwing hawks and frugina's hawks. However, that's not always the case. Some locations you can get dark rough legs a little more frequently than light rough legs. In Florida, dark short tails tend to be a little more common than light short tails. But in general, the dark birds tend to be tend to be rare. There are also intermediate color variants, and for the most part in this talk, I'm going to lump how to identify intermediate birds with dark birds um, because they tend to be darker than light birds, but also lighter than dark birds. But a lot of the same characteristics will hold true for the species. Um, also, just a quick note on semantics. As a personal preference, I don't really care for the words morph or phrase. I like to just use the adjectives light and dark and then a noun, so either a bird or a particular species. So, for example, in this photograph, there are two dark broadwing hawks. And so to me, it's less confusing. It's a little faster. So that's why I personally prefer it, but use whatever, whatever is comfortable for you. Similarly, there are some things that may appear dark, but aren't. I made an awful eagle pun earlier, um, continuing on the trend of gulls after a Mars talk last, last time. And something that I, I noticed with gulls, specifically great blackback and adult great blackback, is I would sometimes find myself asking, is this a dark mantled gull? And I found as soon as I was asking the question, the answer is always no. When you see a dark gull, you always know it's a dark gull. And the true, the same is pretty much true for dark raptors. So in both of these photos, they're very backlit birds. You can see still quite a bit of light coming in on the coverts on the bird on the right, and also in the body on the bird on the left. It's, they're, they're not truly dark, they're just in poor light. So I find that if you have to ask, the answer is no to be a very useful guideline. Uh, hopefully you do too, but again, if not, no worries. Interestingly as well, there are a couple of buteos that don't have dark color variants. So red-shouldered hawks in California are darker than other red-shouldered hawks. And there are some color variants that are substantially lighter, especially Extimus in Southern Florida. But the bird on the left is pretty much the darkest that a red shoulder ever gets. And greyhawks stay, adult greyhawks stay very consistently gray as their name suggests. So most other beauties have, have dark color variants, but for whatever reason, these two don't. So with that, I thought we'd then shift on to a little bit of, of audience participation. Um, so I suspect these quizzes will get a little more difficult as we go on. 
But to start with, the first quiz is going to be the bird in the lower left. There's two birds in this photo. This photo is not a composite. So this is how the photo is taken. The lighting is consistent. The size comparison between the two birds is consistent. OK, and here is the quiz. And so hopefully the quiz choices just popped up. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to read those quiz choices for you. Your options for the bird number one in the lower left corner are black vulture. And these options are going to be the same for all of the quizzes. Your options are black vulture, turkey vulture, golden eagle, common black hawk, broad-winged hawk, short-tailed hawk, Swainson's hawk, zone-tailed hawk, red-tailed hawk, and ferruginous hawk. And Ted, just let everyone know, you can scroll down for all the raptors to choose from, and you can move the poll from uh, within your screen in case you can't see something. Ah, perfect. Thank you. And uh, people are answering pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, let's. Uh, most of the, the majority of people have already answered. Let's give everyone another five seconds. Yeah, I think for this one, we can move pretty yeah. quickly. Hopefully there's not going to be a lot of debate. Exactly. Okay. And we're going to end the poll in three, two, one. And you want the answer? Uh, yeah, I get to see the... Yeah. Oh, perfect. So vast, vast majority, 89% of people voted for turkey vulture with with a small percentage for, for black vulture and broadwing hawk. Those voting for turkey vulture were correct. Really, really long, wide wings, silvery primaries, not much of a head, long tail, dark, very, very dark coverts. Exactly correct. And now we'll switch to the bird in the upper right corner. And again, this is not a composite. This was an actual photo. So size comparison is could be useful. This bird is smaller than a turkey vulture. OK, and oh, here we go. And quiz two is up. And once again, those answer options are black vulture, turkey vulture, golden eagle, common black hawk, broad winged hawk, short-tailed hawk, Swainson's hawk, zone-tailed hawk, red-tailed hawk, and ferruginous hawk. And we have about a dozen people that are quick on the button, and then <laughs> everyone else is slowly coming in. And now we're kind of slowing down. Let's give everyone another five seconds. Please get your answers in four, three, two, and one. Thank you. And here are the results. Okay, this one split a little heav more heavily between with some people going for Broadwing, others for Swainson's, others for Redtail, others for Ferruginous. One of the big giveaways for this bird is that the flight feathers are substantially darker than the coverts. In most birds, it's the other way around. It also has really long swept back wings, white undertail coverts, and I'll go through this a little more in detail when we get to the species identification. But this is indeed a Swainson's hawk. Cool. So with that, we will shift to quiz number three. Uh, a note about this is be careful that any bird that's going away from you in this position is always going to have pointed wings. Yeah, okay, and here are the questions or the choices. Once again, those choice options are black vulture, turkey vulture, golden eagle, common black hawk, broad winged hawk, short tailed hawk, Swainson's hawk, zone tailed hawk, red tailed hawk, ferruginous hawk. All right. So far, we have about a third of the people who have answered. And a few more. All right. And uh, I think Mark has to start singing uh, the Jeopardy theme song. But until he gets on the mic, let's give oh, it. I don't another... know if I'm going to do that. <laughs> let's give everyone another five, four, three, 
get your answers in two and one. Here you go, Ted. So we have a little bit of mix, some votes for, for Broadwing, a few votes for Swainson's, one for Zone Tail, majority for Red Tail, which is correct, and a few for, for Frugianus. Uh, as the name suggests, you can see a little bit of the red coming through the tail on this bird. As a note about red tails and really anything is that when you're looking at the tail from underneath, the tails can appear substantially paler on the underside than they do on the upper side. So this tail, I think, is a really good example of an adult red-tailed hawk that's very, very red on the top, but looks a little more whitish on the underside. You're getting a little bit of the red bleeding through through the light. Uh, but we're also looking at really wide wings, really long wings, has that nice rufous patch on the on the upper chest, which is a good mark for for the intermediate red tails. Great. And so with that, we will shift on to quiz number four. Um, just a note on this bird is that it is gliding left. Okay, and here are the choices. So once again, those options are black vulture, turkey vulture, golden eagle, common black hawk, broad-winged hawk, short-tailed hawk, Swainson's hawk, zone-tailed hawk, red-tailed hawk, and frugitous hawk. I also like the little note that it indicates that host and panelists cannot vote. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I should change that. Oh, well. And it looks like we kind of stalled it about half the people out there. Come on, let's get your votes in in five, four, three, two, and one. Ah, one last one. Here we go. There you go, Ted. Let's see. So a couple votes for Black Vulture, some votes for Common Black Hawk, one vote for Broadwing. The majority still for Zone Tail and a couple for Frugianus. Zone Tail Hawk is indeed correct. That was my hint of the bird is gliding left, that it's not in a flap. So the, the pronounced dihedral is not an artifact of, you know, maybe this instant in time. Mm -hmm. It's very, very blackish throughout. Five marginated primaries, pretty obvious yellow bill. You can even see some yellow in the feet white tail band and we'll get a little more into to zone tail as well i mean all of these species and the options will be covered in this talk great so with that we'll shift on to our final note uh or our final quiz sorry um please note that this photo like the first one is also not a composite so you may find that it's easier to ID the light birds first and then use them for a comparison for the bird in the lower left and as the same with the choices that we had before, our options are black vulture, turkey vulture, golden eagle, common black hawk, broad-winged hawk, short-tailed hawk, Swainson's hawk, zone-tailed hawk, red-tailed hawk, and frugianus hawk. All right, some of the votes are starting to come in. And you're right, Ted, these are getting more challenging, or were getting more challenging as they went on. Okay, let's close the polling in five, four, three, two, and one. And here you go, Ted. Let's see. So we have some votes for common black hawk, four for, for broadwing hawk. So this is, yeah, this is much more split. Two for short tail, three for Swainson's, three for zone tail, one for red tail, and two for frugians. So the first thing we have is that this bird is, is there's a Swainson's hawk. The young bird on the right is a Swainson's hawk. It's larger than the other two birds in the photo. The other light bird that's above it is a broadwing hawk, has a really nice clear, clear tail band. We see on our bird that it's smaller than the Swainson's hawk. It's you know about the size of the broadwing, maybe a touch, touch larger. So it's a fairly small raptor. So that eliminates almost everything except for broadwing and short tail. 
And when we're comparing it directly to the, the Broadwing, we note that it doesn't have a white tail band. An adult Broadwing should have that. But it does have this really solid, dark trailing edge to the wing that a young Broadwing wouldn't have. So there's other, we'll get to some, some other tricks for how to identify short-tailed hawk as well. But this is indeed a, a dark short-tailed hawk. Cool, thank you. So with that, how do we identify dark raptors? And for this talk, I'm gonna, while, while my focus tends to be on flight, I am gonna try to, to give identification tips for perched birds as well. And when you're in flight, it's it's a lot of the same things as in my first talk. What's the wing length? What's the wing width? Tail length, tail width. What do you do if you don't have other birds in the photo to compare with? As a rough generalization, it's good to use the length of the body. So the lines in that flight photo can be used to, as a rough comparison. Okay, so are these longer than the body, shorter than the tip of the body? But then also flight style. Does it fly with a dihedral or a modified dihedral or no dihedral? It's really flat. Flat, are the wings in a V? What's uh, how does it flap? Those are all really useful, especially for trying to identify something at distance. And then when you're looking at perched birds, some things to look at are the bill and the sear colors. Uh, what's the overall color scheme? So as a note on the the two perched red tails here, the bird on the right is dark, the bird on the left is not. Um, they, they were paired up actually just, just below Bear Divide in Los Angeles. Um, what's the length of the wings relative to the tail? Is it really long winged? Is it short winged? Are the wings about the length of the tail? Looking at the tail, is there a white band on the tail? Is there not a white band on the tail? Look at the legs and those tarsi. Are the tarsi feathered? Are they not feathered? And these are some, some useful tips for, for identifying. Color palette, the, whether or not it's more cold colors of, of blacks and grays versus warm colors of, of browns and reds um, can be useful for both in-flight and perch birds. I think it tends to be a little easier to see on perch birds, but lighting is always a great equalizer and everything. And... <sighs> Because shape and structure tend to be so widely used, you find a lot of silhouettes used as practice and aids and when, you're, when you're working on hawk watching, specifically to focus on those shape and structure. You don't really get behavior from a still image silhouette, but shape and structure are really valuable. You don't get as distracted by specific color, specific plumage details. But that said, you can still, the general tonal patterns, the general color patterns can still be useful. And while those vary at distance, it's it can be very beneficial in separating out species for, for dark raptors. So with that, I figured we would shift into to species ID. Um, and this slide contains all of the raptor species that I'm going to cover today. There's also one additional bonus bird that I'm not but that one I will leave as um, just kind of a challenge to see if you can if you can find it and see see what it is. And there are multiple individuals of of species on this slide. But I thought to start we would we would begin with red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawk is probably the most common raptor across the United States, certainly for Budios. They're really, they're quite a large raptor. They have really long wings, really wide wings. Even for Budios, pretty long winged bird, wide tail, kind of medium length tail. They have rounded wings, which is helped by those five emarginated primaries. So you count the distinct feathers. And as always with, with emarginated primaries, be a little careful if the wing's not quite open all the way or the bird's molting then that can change the number of, of slotted primaries, but it can be a really useful tool. It's, it's usually a lot easier to see in photos than it is to see live, but it can be a useful tool in separating species. And we'll get to, that'll be another trick when we get to broad wings and short tails is that number can make a difference. So red tails have five, is having five, they have slightly, slightly rounded, more rounded wings. They tend to fly with their wings pushed forward. They have a dihedral, but it's not usually super pronounced. It's not an extremely strong dihedral as in something like a turkey vulture. 
And the wings tend to bulge in the, the inner primary secondaries to give a little bit of a curve, but it tends to give this really wide winged look. Uh, as one other note, the feather banding, the, the primary and secondary banding in red tails varies um, also by subspecies, but also by distance. So it can be really difficult to see, oh, is this really heavily barred? Is this not? As such, it's not usually a useful characteristic just in and of itself for identifying the species. Within red-tailed hawk, both the, the Western and Harland subspecies have dark forms, but for whatever reason, the Eastern form does not. Uh, the Eastern subspecies doesn't. So it's another one of those things, who knows why that's the case, but it's, it's kind of a fun thing to ponder and think about. As they're perched, Red tails, the wings tend to be shorter than the tail. If you have an adult and you can see the back of the tail tends to be that really pronounced red, unless it's an adult harlands, in which case it can be really gray. Young birds, the tails are, are brown with thin, darker brown tail bands. Generally, red tails tend to be warmer color tones, more browns and reds, but an exception to that is harlands because harlands can be very black and cold tones. They tend to have little white in the face. If so, it's usually centered or close to the eyes and around the bill. The sear tends to have a bit of a greenish cast to it, so it's not quite a bright yellow sear as some species have. They have unfeathered tarsi, so you can just see the legs, especially on that bird on the right. You can see the, the, the tarsi very clearly. And again, tends to be one of the the most common birds across the, the country. So learning the common bird, you can use that as a basis to start comparing other species. So if you know your red tail really well and start being, why is this a red tail? And then start asking the question, why isn't this a red tail? From there, I figured we'd switch into Swainson's hawks. Swainson's hawks are also a lot roughly the same size as a red tail. They have much longer appearing wings and very pointed wings. And the pointed aspect is, is driven by them only having four marginated primaries instead of five helps give this more felt looking wings. So while the wings are wide, they don't appear quite as wide as what they are just due to how long wings are. As I mentioned during the quizzes, Swainson's hawks are cool because their flight feathers are darker than their coverts. So even within the, and that's consistent across color variants. So yeah, that really bright light adult at the bottom, the, those really white coverts and body versus kind of more an intermediate bird on the left with still white coverts starting to get a little bit darker. And then you have that dark bird above the light adult where now the coverts are substantially darker. However, they're still lighter than those primaries. Tails tend to be, have a, one dark, terminal band, but no, nothing in the way of bright white tail bands on it. But they do have white under tail coverts, and that tends to be pretty consistent. It can be difficult to see at distance, but it tends to be pretty consistent across Swainson's hawks. They also have a curved trailing edge to their wings, so it gives uh, it gives a quite a different shape than, than you see in red tails. When they're perched, as mentioned with flying, they have really long wings, so those wings typically project beyond the tail. Maybe sometimes they can be about the length of the tail, but usually Swainson's hawks, the wings go, go well beyond the tail. They also have unfeathered tarsi. The white in the face tends to be, it's a little more extensive than in red tails usually, but it's still fairly restricted. You can get it into the chin, as you see on the bird on the left. Their color tones throughout, they tend to be, in general, tend to be pretty warm, but with grays interspersed through. So especially with that bird on the left, you see it's fairly warm color, but that head and face are almost entirely gray. The bird on the right, you can see random patches of gray peeking through as well. Switching to ferruginous hawk, ferruginous hawks are big. They're bigger than red tails and Swainson's hawks. They're almost eagle-like in size. They have really, so they have a really large size, they have long wings. They have fairly pointed wings, despite the fact they also have five emarginated primaries. But that 10th primary tends to be short. 
So it gives this, this much pointed or pointier winged look than you see in a lot of five marginated primary gluteos, which usually tend to have slightly rounded or wings. They have very heavy bodies. Unlike most other adult beauties, Frugian socks don't have that really solid, dark trailing edge to the wings. You can see on these birds, it gets kind of grayish. It's a little darker than the rest of the, the flight feathers, but it's not that solid black of most other, most other beauties. The flight feathers tend to be really clean, really light. And you get these nice wing panels, the white wing panels on the top of the wings, like you see in light birds as well on dark birds. A lot of people like to point to the them having white commas close to the carpals. It's something that, that you see in a number of photos, but I don't find it to be 100% consistent across photos. You can see this photo on the right, you can make out those, those white commas. The photo on the left, it's, it's a lot more difficult. So that can vary based on, on angle and, and lighting. And so I, I, it's, it's something else you can use. And it's always good to use a suite of characteristics, but it's not something that I like to use as, as a standalone characteristic. Tails, especially from the underside, tend to be pretty clean from the top. It's kind of reddish to white. Oh, and one other thing about uh, Frisian socks, they tend to fly with a with a light dihedral. So when they're perched, probably the most obvious thing to me on a perched Frisian sock is that really strong gape line. That line from the bill that goes under the, the eye is very, very heavily pronounced on Frisian socks. They also have almost no little to no white on the head. You see the bird on the left has a little bit of grayish of the lores, but almost no white on the head. Bills tend to be really blackish, but with quite a bit of yellow in the sears that really helps set off that, that gape line. They do have feathered tarsi. The, the wings tend to be a little bit shorter than the tail. And overall, they tend to be very brownish, warmer tones, maybe a little bit of colder tones into the back. But and they also have that really blocky, large head. And again, it's a very large bird. Shifting over to rough-legged hawk. Rough-legged hawks are, are one of my favorites. They're just starting to come back through again. And... They're also quite a large bird, roughly the size of Swainson's and Redtail, with really long wings, pronounced dihedral, and a fairly long tail for a beautio. Liguori describes it as a cross between a red-tailed hawk and a northern herring to give a sense of kind of that long tail. And also that comes into the flight style of rough legs tend to be much more buoyant than, than other, other beautios. So they can get a lift a little easier. They have they tend to have fairly deep wing beats. The wings, they have five marginated primaries, but the wings almost look a little more squared off than, than rounded due to more variable shaped emarginated primaries. They have the adults have a very solid black terminal band. Young birds, that can be a lot more diffuse. And in adult males, you can get more multiple bands. But in the adults, you tend to have that really strong black band followed by a, a very large white band in the tail. As they're perched, rough legs, like Ferugian's hawk, rough legs also have feathered tarsi. I think both of these photos do a pretty good job of, of showing the, the feathering on the tarsi. They have long wings. The wings often extend beyond the length of the tail. Sometimes if you see them from underneath, you can see that dark tail band followed by the, the large wide white band. If they're adults on young birds, again, it's a little more, it's a little more diffuse. They tend to have small rounded heads and really, really small beaks. And rough legs will often perch on very, very small perches. So this branch on the one on the left, it's not a very large branch for a bird of that size. The white in the face is usually quite limited to just around the, the lores and outer lores without much else. And they also have fairly limited yellow in the sear. Shifting over to broadwings, broadwings are substantially smaller than anything else that we've covered so far tonight. They have, in addition to being quite a bit smaller, they also have a very unique shape relative to the other species we've covered where they look almost triangular. The wings are very pointed. They're, 
they're beautiful. So they have long and wide wings, but they're not as, they don't appear as long and wide as the other species that we've covered. They, like Swainson's hawks, have four emarginated primaries, so that helps give them this really pointed winged look. The adult birds have a very obvious white tail band. The young birds do not. If depending on the photo and the angle, like this bird in the middle, you can see two white tail bands. That's usually hard to see the second one, they, but they do have it. They And they also fly very, very flat. They don't have a dihedral. And as part of the smaller size, they tend to turn a little faster. They tend to rise a little faster. As they're perched, the adults, as mentioned, have kind of that obvious tail band. Young birds don't have it. They tend to be very brownish throughout with almost no white in the face. The sear tends to be pretty yellow and the amount of black on the bill is a little variable, but not a lot of black on the bill. There's a small squat wrap with short wings that tend to have very, very warm tones. And broad wings, kind of like Frugia's hawks, is a very small percentage of, of the populations that, that are dark. And now we have short-tailed hawk, which is one of my favorites. And part of one of the reasons that short tails are my are one of my favorites is that when they fly, they often fly with their wings fairly straight, except that they have just their tips up. So depending on the angle, this can make it look kind of like an airplane wing, or if they're turning, it can give them this really, really pronounced V. And what I really like about short tails is that that was something that I witnessed in person before I ever read it in a book. And so it was really fun to, to find an ID tip that was really useful kind of on my own. Short tails are really poorly named relative to broad winged hawks and vice versa, because short tailed hawks have broader wings than broad winged hawks and broad winged hawks have shorter tails than short tailed hawks. So it, it gets very, very confusing if you focus too much too much on the names. Short-tailed hawks in size are also very close to, to broad wings. They're a little smaller than, than most of the other species that we've covered so far. And as mentioned, their wings are a little bit broader. Their, their tails are a little bit longer. They have five marginated primaries instead of four. So their wings tend to be a little more rounded. The adults don't have that big white tail band that the broad wings have. In some angles, they can look like mini red tails but the wings aren't quite that long and they're not that quite that wide. They don't bulge quite as much as in the secondaries as red tails do. And that solid dark terminal, subterminal band on the adults is not something you'll, you'll really see in a red tail and the young birds, the banding on the tail on the young birds can be a little deceptive. Usually they tend to be a quite a bit, the young birds tend to be quite a bit streakier than the young broad wings, which are often fairly, fairly solid. Perched, which I like to joke that short tails never perch because it's all hard to ever see them perch, but they, they do indeed. And again, they're small relative to the other beauties. So they're about the size of the broad wing, typically warm browns. The face doesn't really have white so much as it's a little more like concentrated gray. And for what they do have, it's mostly around the, the frontal shield of the lores. The wings tend to be shorter than the tail. There's no tail band, excuse me. There's there's no tail band, no white, large white tail band in the tail. And they have unfeathered tarsi. Oh, and I went, forgot to mention broad wings. Broad wings also have unfeathered tarsi as well. Shifting over to zone tails. Zone tails are always dark. So unlike everything else that we've covered up to this point that has dark forms and light forms, zone tails are, are always, always dark. And at a distance, they look very much like turkey vultures. They have these long wings, these wide wings. They hold them in a very pronounced dihedral. They'll even sway back and forth. That middle photo is a zone-tailed hawk on the left and a turkey vulture on the right. So it gives you the size and shape comparison between the two. Zone tails, depending on the angle, the wings tend to be a little more rectangular, a little more squared off. They have five emarginated primaries as opposed to the turkey vultures, six. 
So the wings aren't quite as rounded. The tail tends to be quite a bit more squared off than, than turkey vultures. It tends to be a shorter tail and more squared off. So that can be a really useful way to separate the two at distance. When they're up close, as you see with the bird on the right, you're pretty much never gonna confuse a zone tail talk with a turkey vulture. Excuse me. They also tend to have a blockier head and that head tends to be a little easier to see at distance than on a turkey vulture as well. They have that large, adults have quite a large white tail band, though the young birds don't. The banding within the, the primary is much more so than you'd ever see on a turkey vulture, which just has those silvery flight feathers. But zone tails have, have the really nice banding, which as you can see varies by feather. Perched, they're very, very blackish. Rather than having, they don't really have those warm tones that a lot of the other species that we've seen have. They have quite a lot of yellow in the sere, those really bright yellow feet, which the legs, the tarsi are unfeathered. And rather than having white in the face, as most of the species we've covered, it, it's much more of a gray. If you have an adult, you can see that large white tail band. The wings tend to be about the length of the tail, maybe a little bit longer. And they're just a really, really striking, striking bird. I, swim tails are really fun. For comparison in flight, I don't think you'd ever confuse Blackhawk with zone tail. Blackhawks have really long wings and crazy wide wings. The wings have, in some ways, kind of like red tails. They have a bulge in the in the inner wings, but it's much more pronounced. That the wings almost blend in with with the tail. They do have a large white tail band. Well, sorry, I want to preface that I'm not going to be covering young blackhawks because young blackhawks aren't super dark. So this, these traits, these color traits, are true for for adult kind of black ox. So really wide wings, really rounded wings. The, the shape profile for common black hawk relative to pretty much anything else that's regular in this country is very, very different. Maybe you confuse them for, for black vultures. The wings are black entirely through and through. They have the white tail band, which both of those things will be different on, on black vultures. A lot of yellow in the face, yellow legs, if you can see it. It's just such a cool, crazy shape to see. Perched, they're also like zone tails, they tend to be very blackish throughout and they have thick, stocky legs, very extensive yellow into the sear and into the face. So while most of those other species have had some sort of white or gray, Blackhawks tend to have yellow that are going into the face, much more so than you'd ever see on a zone tail. And while they're also blackish, common blackhawks tend to have little like silver edgings, gray edgings on a lot of the feathers, uh, especially in the upper chest and, and back and head that you don't see in zone tail to the same extent. They have large white tail band and unfeathered legs, so the tarsi are unfeathered, quite a bit of of black on the tip of the bill, but otherwise, yeah, that extensive, extensive yellow that superficially it might be easy to convince, can confuse black hawk and zone tail, but you start looking closer, especially at the face and head, they look quite a bit different. So I'll we'll shift to Harris's. Harris's, I think, is probably not typically associated with, with dark raptors, though I make the case here that man, they are dark. If you get a good look at one, they have those obvious red shoulders, so contrasting white and black tail, the strong terminal band. They have long wings, they have wide wings, they have quite a long tail. And at distance, they can almost appear a little caracara like, especially the young birds that have those pallor patches on the wings. The part of that, I think, is, is the result of, of the wings being pushed forward. They have very, very rounded wings, usually six to seven marginated primaries that help give that, that rounded wing look. Perched, the adults are pretty unmistakable. Uh, those rufous shoulders 
give away a lot. Otherwise, they tend to be quite blackish. Quite a bit of yellow in the face, unfeathered tarsi, white undertail coverts. You maybe see the, the tail bands. Young birds don't have those tail bands, but you still see the, the white undertail coverts. Kind of a blockier head as well. The wings tend to be shorter than the tail, which is Harris's hawk is more just because the tail is, is quite long rather than the wings are particularly short. Here we'll switch to Northern Harrier, which as far as I'm aware, finding dark Northern Harrier is very, very rare. To my knowledge, there have been six records total. Um, thankfully, I, I was very fortunate to be able to see the bird that the Shields found at Paiute. And Harriers as a shape are very, very distinctive, super long wings, super long tail, both of which tend to be fairly narrow and they fly in with a very strong dihedral. In migration, they can be very high and people get confused because you don't see the white rump. Well, on the dark birds, they don't have a white rump. So switching to the shape and structure differences tend to be much more useful than, than just straight plumage characteristics alone. But I find harriers to have a very, very distinctive shape. And this these dark birds are really, really cool. And if you ever are close and have the opportunity, I highly recommend trying to see a dark harrier because it's really uncommon. It's a really spectacular bird. Also, please get photos of one perched. Uh, this is your only slide in the talk that I'm completely cheating and using a silhouette. To my knowledge, there aren't any photos of dark carrier perched, and at least not that I could find. So rather than, than not show a photo, I decided to make a, a light harrier as a, as a silhouette. Harriers tend to be quite a bit different from the other birds that we've seen up to this point. They perch on the ground very frequently. They, they tend to stay very low. The facial discs look quite distinct, and there's that really, really long tail, really, really long wings. They have a very svelte-like long appearance overall as they're perched. This angle's a little tricky, especially with the branches, but you can still see that really long tail that just solely going off of the silhouette, maybe you're starting to wonder, oh, well, maybe, maybe it's an exhibitor or something else with such a long tail. But exhibitors also don't have, well, exhibitors in this country don't have dark color variants. So shifting over to turkey vultures, which also have a fairly pronounced dihedral and long wings. At a distance, you can confuse turkey vultures and, and harriers pretty readily. If they're up close, it's never going to be a confusion. Same for zone tails. If you see a turkey vulture up close, you can see that unfeathered head you can see the silvery remiges the rounded long rounded tail you're never going to confuse a zone tail with a turkey vulture up close but at a distance they can look remarkably remarkably similar and you can also confuse turkey vultures with golden eagles they also have very long wings very wide wings turkey vultures though are such good flyers that they're almost always rocking and zone tails, as a mimic of, of a turkey vulture, will also rock. Gold needle isn't, so gold needles tend to be very direct, very straight as they fly. But six, six marginated primaries give them fairly rounded wings, very large bird, super long, super wide wings, very, very strong dihedral. Perched, the unfeathered head tends to be really distinctive amongst vultures. The the degree to which the head is unfeathered tends to be, uh, turkey vultures tend to have a little more feathering up into the neck than black vultures do. Young turkey vultures can have dark heads like the bird on the right. You can see the, the cranial shape is still the same as turkey vulture. And you don't have the same level of, of ridges and folds like you have on a black vulture. Turkey vultures also tend to be much warmer throughout. They tend to have a lot of these really rich browns and golds that when you, when you look at their, their flight feathers are really, really pretty. I know a lot of people don't give vultures much of a second glance, but they're really cool, really amazing flyers. All those nice like, gold and highlights on the wings, I think are really, really cool to watch. 
Shifting to golden eagle, golden eagles are also very large. Like turkey vultures, they tend to fly with a dihedral, really long, wide rounded wings, but they have that feathered head. So you're not going to see a turkey vulture with a feathered head, a long tail. If you're not confusing golden eagle with turkey vulture, then you might be confusing golden eagle with bald eagle. And while the head's more distinct and noticeable than turkey vulture, it's a lot less noticeable and distinct than a bald eagle. Bald eagles also don't tend to fly with as much of a dihedral. Golden eagles have quite a, a pronounced dihedral. There's usually a bulge in the inner flight feathers as well, as secondaries, primaries, that gives a more curved shape. The wings tend to be a little more, a little more rounded in, in the ends as well. If you can see the golden heckles, then that's also a good a good indicator. However, be really careful, especially with, with the light. If you have a bird that's coming head on, you have the light that's, that's the bird's coming head on to the light, then even something that's not necessarily gold, like a young bald eagle might be able to reflect like a lighter brown light. So be a little careful with the gold around the head, especially on a bird in flight, especially at distance. Uh, fun thing to watch for too is if you have golden eagle and turkey vultures around the turkey vultures are almost always higher than the golden eagle they don't want any part of having a golden eagle above them perched again is an eagle it's just a huge massive size very feathered head large large bill relative to everything else that we've seen though we'll see in the next species it's not quite that large they have feathered legs and the wings tend to be about tail length. And again, if you can see, and in perch birds, it tends to be a little easier to see that golden nape and head that, that give the golden eagles their name. They tend to be warmer tones with me, some blackish mixed in, but overall they, they tend to be warmer than, than colder. As the other large bird that we have in terms of eagles is Bald eagle, I'm going to be mostly focusing on, on young bald eagles as adults have those obvious white head and tail. Um, young birds do have, the juveniles have white in the axillaries. Other ages, the white tends to get a little more scattered, especially through, through the bellies. And golden eagles are very, you often hear the, the word plank-like, or they look like a flying board. They have really long wings, really, really wide wings, but they tend to be very even. And so there's pretty straight trailing edge, pretty straight leading edge that gives us this rectangular look. The head is also much larger relatively on a golden or on a bald eagle than on a golden eagle. So the head and the tail look to be roughly the same length, whereas on golden eagle, the tail seems obviously longer than the head. It's not something that you're gonna have to ask, oh, is it? It tends to, to be a noticeable difference, whereas on bald, it's like, oh, I think it's roughly the same. I like to think of the head and tail as, as trunnions on a cannon, but uh, flying plank tends to be a little more popular. The younger, the older feathers tend to be a little lighter brown than, than the new feathers. And you can see the bird on the left has a few of those older feathers that haven't quite been, been replaced yet. They're a little longer, a little wider. Perched, again, it's just a massive, massive bird. Tend to be a little more blackish throughout, whereas goldens tend to be a little browner. Bald eagles tend to be a little, a little colder, a little blacker. Really large, heavy, pronounced bill. You look at the head, doesn't have, doesn't have the gold. And the legs, the tarsi are unfeathered. So the, seeing the tarsi can be a really useful. If you just have a head on view, you can't see the back of the head. You can't see the gold. You can see the legs on the bird. That can be a really useful key for separating bald eagle from gold eagle. Next, we'll shift to black vultures, which are also quite large. Black vultures probably are most similar to turkey vulture and maybe common black hawk, but I found that black vultures can be confused with just about anything if, depending on the wind conditions, the angle, what the bird's doing, that it's it's a pretty remarkably diverse bird for something that you think is, it would be just always super consistent, which 
it often isn't, but really long wings, really wide wings that have those silver marginated primaries on the outer wings, a really short squared off tail it gives kind of a triangular look. It almost blends in with the wings kind of like on, on common Blackhawk, but they're entirely dark throughout with the exception of those, of those silver marginated primaries. On the right, you can see one with a Swainson's hawk and a turkey vulture for, for comparison. And turkey vulture has that silver throughout their images, whereas black vulture, it's restricted just to those marginated primaries. And when when black vultures flap, it, it always makes me laugh because they have this really, really deep downstroke and a really, really shallow upstroke. And, and it's really fast. So to me, when they're flapping, it always gives this impression of, oh, no, I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall. I'm OK. I'm OK. I'm OK. Oh, I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall. I'm, gonna... I'm OK. I'm OK. And it's just such a distinctive flap that you can see one flapping from a mile away and know that it's a, that it's a black vulture. It's, it's a really, I, I just, I always find it really, really funny that you have a bird that has the appearance of it's afraid that it's going to fall out of the sky. Perched, it's a little easier to see the head relative to turkey vulture. They have gray heads with a lot of wrinkles, a lot of folds. That young turkey vulture, the head was quite a bit smoother, tend to be very black throughout, as the name suggests, the exception of those, those silvery, those silvery primaries. The legs can also kind of appear whitish or blue, depends on how much excrement they have on them. It's not really anything beyond turkey vulture, I think, that you'd confuse black vulture with. Maybe if you had something in the distance, it'd be a large unknown raptor. But if you get a decent look, they're they're pretty they're pretty distinctive. Shifting on, I thought we'd, we'd switch gears a little bit and shift over to Merlin and specifically the, the Suclei subspecies, the Pacific Coast subspecies of Merlin, also called Black Merlin. They're exceedingly, exceedingly dark, especially for Merlins. And the important thing is to look at those flight feathers, especially on the top side. There aren't any, there's no spotting that's popping through on the wings. You're trying to separate black Merlin from other Merlins. Those, those remedies are really, really cleanly dark. The, the head tends to be also very, very dark. And relative to all of the other species that we've covered so far, Merlin looks radically different. It's substantially smaller even than, than Broadwing. Very, very pointed wings, very, very powerful flyers, kind of medium length tail, blocky head, and Merlins don't care about anything or anyone and will dive bomb anything and can get away with it. They're Pretty much like 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 most falcons, maybe with the exception of kestrel, merlins are, are a good example of power and motion. Perched again, they're very very blackish throughout. The wings don't quite reach the tail. Unfeathered tarsi, as with all falcons, they have a dark eye. Very very blocky head. Uh, and these dark birds. The mustachial mark often will kind of fade into the auriculars. It tends to be kind of one even tone throughout. Look quite a bit different from, from everything else that we've covered. And now we'll shift to kind of deer falcon, which is more of a, of a merlin on, on steroids. The dark deer falcons tend to be quite uncommon in the U.S. It's a very, very large falcon, almost approaching that of a, of a red tail. Very, very stocky, very, very, very powerful, long, wide tail, long wings. And the wings are more rounded on a deer falcon than on other falcons. So they still have pointed wings, but they're not quite pointed to the same degree as another species. Unlike most other falcons, <laughs> deer falcons will catch their prey in steady flight. They don't get them out of a dive, so they just simply outfly their prey. Very, very hefty bird. Uh, as a note, both of these are, are using young birds. Young birds for, for dark and, and gray birds are, are really difficult to, to, to separate out. Um, but the adult dark birds tend to get into even a little more blackish than, than what you're seeing in, in these, these young birds. When you see deer falcon perched, it's just a really, really large stocky falcon. And the mustachial mark that they have is not anywhere near as thick as on, say, a peregrine. And if you only see a photo 
you can kind of see people confuse Jeer Falcon for Merlin. However, if you ever see one in real life, there's never a question. Merlin is really small. Jeer Falcon is really, really big. On top of that, Jeer Falcons are really, really shouldery. To me, they look kind of like an inverted arrowhead. Of You just have that base for the head, and then it comes out to the tips and then goes down. Very triangular, very, very short wings relative to that long tail and just a very heavy stocky falcon really really impressive to to see white-tailed hawks white-tailed hawks can look deceptively similar to swainson's hawks they have really long wings they have that kind of nice curve to their wings as swainson's hawks do as well the coverts though are still tend to be a little darker than the remedies. They have four marginated primaries, like Swainson's, gives them that really pointed look. They also fly with dihedral. Tail tends to be a lot cleaner. The Those remedies tend to be a lot lighter, depending on how well you can see them. If you look at the bird on the right and see it's not these really, really heavy, dark remedies like what you have in a Swainson's hawk, but just a very tight series of banding. But at distance, that can that can bleed away. They can be they can be difficult to to separate out. You can have some white on the undertail. It doesn't tend to be as as pronounced as distinctive as on a Swainson's hawk. Perched, they well perched and in flight, they they tend to have that white upper chest as well. You're not usually going to see a dark Swainson's hawk with a, with a white upper chest like that. They have long wings, wings are longer than the tail, unfeathered tarsi. The bill tends to be much colder than most of the other birds that we've covered. The, the bill and seer color matter is kind of ranging from like a bluish to gray, maybe like dirty yellow, which is which is quite distinctive from, from the other species that we've covered. Otherwise, fairly plain faced and yeah, unfeathered tarsi. And they they vary from cold tones to, to warmer tones, but even for the warmer browns they have, it tends to be colder brown colors, if that makes if that makes sense. Shifting over to hook build kites and specifically adult males, and while technically they're more gray, they often look black at a distance or blackish. And from a flight perspective, they well, from both flight and perch perspective, they look radically different than anything else on this on this list. Of really long wings, really wide wings, really really rounded wings, quite a long tail. That can, it's, I think it's a deceptively long tail relative to how how long and wide the wings are, but the wings pinch in at the body, and it's just such a distinctive shape. You'll often hear it referred to as paddle shaped. Uh, it also, as a result of those wings pinching in, the head tends to be much more distinctive. Quite a long, quite a long tail. If you can get them in nice light, the the wings tend to have a a, a checkered look, similar to to a red shoulder. Just from the underside, they're still much darker than than the red shoulder, but but you get a lot of that white and black checkerboard pattern coming through. Though that's often difficult at at birds at distance. You can see on these two photos, it doesn't really come through. Perched, they're, again, they're really distinctive. They have a lot more yellow in the face. Sometimes that extends up into the lores over the eye. Large white tail band, fairly distinctive hooked bill. There's not really much that you'll confuse hook billed kite with in the US. Um, they, they tend to be blackish to dark gray, usually, usually more colder tones than, than warmer tones. Shifting into snail kite, snail kites in flight have really long, really wide wings. They fly very drooped, very arched. It's almost like an osprey has has their wings in an M, but on snail kites, it's, it's even droopier. The tail isn't super, super short, but can appear so with such long, wide wings. They do have that white that can be confused for a northern harrier, especially if you see one that's going away. If you're only identifying the bird based on the white, then you might confuse snail kite for a northern harrier. But if you look at it for, for more than you know half a second, it's it's usually quite distinctive from from Northern Harrier. If you can see the head and the bill, that really long 
hook to bill is is also quite distinctive and perched that's probably gonna be the first thing that you see the bare parts the legs and sear can range from kind of light oranges to deep deep red really really long hooked bill very very long hooked talons for kind of catching and getting into those snails tend to be colder toned i mean the adults males especially tend to be very very black uh, really really distinctive birds the wings are about the same length as the tail i don't think there's much else on the this list that that you're really going to confuse for anything else so that wraps up raptors. I did want to just briefly cover corvids as well, because corvids are roughly the, the same size as a lot of these raptor species, and they they're very, very dark. So, but the big thing you want to look for uh, on separating corvids from raptors are the bill. That bill is just not a raptor bill. It's a large, heavy bill. And as you go up from crow to chihuahuan raven to common raven, that bill just keeps getting larger and larger and heavier and heavier but they're always very, very blackish. You know, maybe they get a blue sheen depending on what the light's like, but they're always very, very dark through and through. And again, size can be beneficial. So on that photo on the right, you see the red tail with the common raven, with the chihuahuan raven. So if you have other things around to compare, that can be beneficial in, in identifying and separating species. But ideally look for look for the bill. American crows have very squared off tails. Ravens tend to have more of that wedge shape that's a little more rounded. It's slightly less so in Chihuahua than, than common, though. That's a whole different ID conundrum. So in summary, if they're in flight, it's probably easier to look at shape structure than just specific plumage details. So overall plumage patterns can help. Perch birds can be tricky, especially from behind, but as you can try to see the head, legs, and tail. Um, here's a quick look at the, the species that I used in this talk, roughly in order that they appeared. And with that, I'm happy to open it up for any questions people may have. So thank you very much for tuning in. Excellent, Ted. Uh, thank you very, very much for a great, great talk. Um, people, if you have questions, please put it in, please put them, should I say, in the Q&A down um, on the bottom of your screen. It helps, helps us keep track of any questions we may have. Um, Ted, as with your other talk, um, I'm just getting... I get so many great ID tips and uh, I get so much out of it here. It's yeah. wonderful. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, so questions go in the Q&A. Uh, and 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 if you really hate cliffhangers, um, this photo, this this bird in this photo <laughs> is the is the one that I did not talk about in this talk. It shows up in two of the other pictures as well. Um, so uh, I can leave that as, as potentially a, a quiz. If, if you happen to see the the list of species, I did include it in the list of species. It will be <laughs> <Yeah>. very distinctive. <laughs> Excellent. Well, not um, in the Q and A, but, no, but... <laughs> Naresh. Is Jir, is, Naresh says, is Jir Falcon really a real bird? No, it's a global conspiracy, just like that one Pacific Golden Plover in Playona. <laughs> yes. um, so we have a question by Pete who asks, uh, which of these have never been seen in California? Ooh. I'd have to check. Mm. I, to my knowledge, I don't know if there are short-tailed records for California, though it seems like it's possible. Um, I mean, snail kite. Other, there's no way. There's no way snail. snail kite that, there's um, no like, way snail kite has. I highly, highly doubt hook billed kite. Yeah. Um. um other white-tailed hawk in California. White-tailed is probably so? pretty. Pretty uncommon to know records <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, I 
Interestingly, dark Broadwing is probably more common in California than it is most other places. <laughs> interesting. Interesting, interesting. Um, ah, uh, Brad has a question. Uh, says, I enjoyed spending a few hours hawk watching with you down in Veracruz, Ver Veracruz last uh, September. Very impressed with your hawk watching skills. Blah, 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 blah. Just curious, do you know how many broad wings came through Veracruz this season? Uh, we broke a million. Wow. That's awesome. That's a lot of birds. And, and actually, we had, uh, I don't, I didn't actually see the tally on the number of dark broad wings, but I think we probably had the most recorded dark broad wings that we've had in a season as well. It was a really cool, crazy year for seeing dark broad wings down there, maybe two, wow. three hundred dark birds. Wow. That's really cool. And yeah, hi, Brad. Thanks for. For visiting us down very cruise. Very, very cool. Um, I am looking at the California Bird Record Committee site right now to <laughs> see if there's if there's any hook billed kites or <laughs> hawks or I mostly structured it with things that are more likely to, to less likely, but there is there is some some liberties with that. Yeah. Um, and here, let me put it in the chat. So anyone who wishes to peruse the bird record committee, uh, checklists, you certainly can do that. If I look at the chat on my screen, does that come through the screen share? No. Oh, okay. I don't believe it does. I believe it's a separate entity within Zoom. Mm-hmm. Um, for those on YouTube, if you're interested, the link is https slash slash California birds, plural, dot org slash checklist dot ASP. Oh, thank you very much. Ted. Thank, you. thank you. Or you can go to California birds dot org and uh, take it from there. And uh, and I think we are slowing down. And. Once Any again, Ted, questions? thank you. Huh? Yeah, no, somebody has to have another question. <laughs> Ted, okay, you, you've you held us in suspense. Oh, oh, for what this bird is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, I was going to forget. This, this is a really cool bird. This is just a little north of San Francisco. This is a hybrid between a common black hawk and a red-shouldered hawk. Oh. And... This is completely nuts. It's completely nuts because what's wow. the black, common black hawk doing there in the first place? Why in the world did it pair up with with a red shoulder? <laughs> a red How did that even work? And then this bird, when I saw it, was also paired with a red shoulder with an adult red shoulder male. Wow! So you know, you know, that's interesting. That raises an interesting question because obviously, in uh, certain bird families, we have lots and lots of hybrids, but we don't have many in hawks, do we? Uh, there's some, there's some reports of, of red tail, rough leg hybrids, that sort of thing. Um, it's, I think it tends to be really difficult to separate out, yeah. but this one is especially crazy because I mean, they're not even the same genus. Mm -hmm. That is, yeah, that's really weird. Uh, the Santa Rosa bird can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. I mean, to my knowledge, it's, it's the not only the hybrid place combination. That... Yeah. Not the hybrid combination that I would have expected. No, no. <laughs> To my knowledge, that's the only place where you can possibly see that bird. Wow, wow. Well, Ted, thank you very, very much for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, it, as always, it gave, it. it's like a fire hose. You give so much information. <laughs> well, like, we're going to have to go back and take like little shot glasses of it. <laughs> but luckily, it'll be up there to, for everyone to use. Thank you again. We really, really appreciate it. Yes, thank yeah, you thanks. so much. Thank you very much we'll, for having we'll, me. And... Well, I'll be looking back at it next time we're trying to figure out some weird raptor that's up there. Absolutely. It's an excellent job. A great summary of, of decrypting the hawks. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I hope everyone has a wonderful uh, New Year's season and join us uh, for field trips and for our next webinar, our next swift mem uh, webinar. No, not quick webinar. 
but Swift, Swift webinar. webinar yes. Yes. <laughs> and with that, thank you all very much. Again, thanks to Ted for presenting this for us. Thank you very much. And we will see you all next time. Take care, everyone. Yep. Thank you, Ted. Good night. See you. Take care.